In the 18th century, a scandal broke out in Cork that ho a horrified the merchant princes because it was one of their class committed in a felony act against another member of their own class. In other words, the abduction of Mary Pike. Mary Pike was one of the heirs to a very wealthy family, Pike bankers. Henry, again, was a member of a very wealthy and a powerful family, merchant princes and the rest. And that horrified the ruling class in the city who talked in hush whispers with afternoon tea, no doubt, in the drawing rooms. It preparated right down to the taverns in the town. The only talk at the time was Henry Brown Hayes and his act. Now, to begin, we go back to Atwell Hayes, his father. His father was married in 1760 in St. Nicholas's Church in Court Street. He married Mary Brown, who I believe came from the Douglas area. Henry was the darling of their eyes, of course, and he was born. And of course, being of the privileged class, he got a privileged education. In those days, there were academies. And if you had uh, money, you got into the academies. But there was another bit of a difference too. You had to be of the right class, shall we say, to be educated in those academies. These academies lasted right up to the 19th century, halfway through it. And they were always classified as school for young gentlemen, academy for young gentlemen, and for young ladies. Now, Henry was a man of old town, and uh, he was also a, an actor, and he had a group of actors with him, and he was performing performances in what is now the Masonic Hall in Tucker Street, which in those days was a theatre, the one which was also a church as in later days, for charities. He then was living, shall we say, righteously, and in those days, gentlemen of wealth and power and privilege used to, uh, shall we say, carry on as they saw fish that they were above the eyes of the law. Were drinking, duly, womanizing, of course, that was the favourite pastime. And Henry was married in 1783 in the Glanmire Church, the church in Glanmire, to Elizabeth, I think, Smith, spelled with an M-Y, whose family was a very powerful and a wealthy family residing in Walford, on the bay across from Yall. Holroyd Smith was the last of them there. And father decided that he'd curtail his wages because he was a member of the family in the brewing. Now, did anybody ever hear of a, a brewer who was short of money? However, he was also the owner and buying properties in the city. He leased from the corporation, Salmon Weir on the, by Gilabi. He also leased from the corporation of Salmon Weir near the Mercy Hospital. And he was slightly eccentric. He uh, used to tend the ball, which was in the old meeting house, which was where the um, two euro shop is. And their balls were held. Not a dance, a ball. And uh, this was a fancy dress, and uh, Henry and um, Atwell arrived one day, and one of those in fancy dress sitting in a small chariot drawn by two goats. However, there's an interesting little note there. Colonel Hayes in Crosshaven, who the family resided in Crosshaven House, he told me that the family bought the property uh, from a Cromwell and officer and uh, 16 something and the house was built a hundred years later. But the fascinating thing, the name of the town around is Connachnagon, the Hill of the Goats. So what's the connection between the Hill of the Goats and Atwell is? He was in um, various committees uh, for the Car Corporation 
and they will they used to meet there. They then transferred us their premises to Turkey Street. And they used to meet there undoubtedly exhausted in Texas from the unfortunate public. And that later became the Masonic Hall. He then was Henry then was also admitted to the corporation as a member, you know. And how he received his title was Lord Le the corporation were holding a meeting and they invited Lord Lieutenant to us and Henry met the Lord Lieutenant Mitchelton and the Lord Lieutenant Knighton. Uh, titles given by the Lord Lieutenant and that they were given out like confetti. Now, Atwell also built Vernonmount. Henry resided there, but Atwell built this. Ah, his magnificent little Georgian mansion. We painted the ceilings, most magnificent stone cantilever staircase. And the decor inside this was really something to look at. However, it had an estate of 95 acres. And anybody living on the south side of the city will always remember the Black Ash. There was a road off the old Kinsale Road running to Vernamont. That was placed there by the Lane family. The Lane family were the owners of a brewery in the South Main Street, taken over by Beamish and Crawfords afterwards. One member of that family, of course, was the famous Sir Hugh Lane. Who designed this is an interesting point? There was a famous architect who was born in Middleton by the name of Morrison. Now he had a residence in Dunlera, which he named Barcous. Barcous, of course, is a little village in France named after a famous French poet. Henry named Henry Hayes when he was transported to New South Wales, named his little house Barcous. Now the interesting thing about it is about this story is that the family of Alan, who were brewers in Middleton, they married into the family of Atwell Hayes. They, in turn, married into the family of Crosbys. Now, these Crosbys resided at Valley High Castle in County Kerry. And that castle was designed by Morrison, so there is a connection between them. Henry then was a spendthrift. They were called young bucks in those days. They had power, privilege and rank, and they made use of it, dueling, drinking, womanising, anything else you can think of. Some of them were even members of the Hellfire Clubs. Not Henry, but in Dublin, quite a number of women was the one in Dublin situated, I think, in the Wicklow Hills. But Henry was run father stopped, I think, giving him an allowance, curtailed his activities. The wife had died, and Henry was looking around, shall we say, for a new wife. He put his eyes on Mary Quick. Mary was the uh, heir, I think, to 20,000 pounds. That's a, a considerable sum of money. So Henry tried this to make acquaintance with her. Now Cooper Penrose, who lives in what is now Lover's Walk, had famous gardens and famous statuary that was brought back from his tours in Europe, which he used to open to the public uh, on request. Henry Henry apparently breezed on there without request. But seeing when Cooper Penrose saw him, he realised that well, he was a knight of the realm, etc, 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 so he showed Henry around. Henry's main object, of course, was to meet Mary Pike, because she was staying there. Henry stillied and dallied, and Cooper Penrose, being a gentleman, invited him to dinner. Now, in those days, the guests never sat at the main table with the family. The guests sat at known as a side table. And the main family were here. Henry couldn't get to meet her because she was over there and Henry was here. 
Anyway, in those days there was abduction clubs. And these clubs formed was um, put the right on a wealthy young lady, abductor, and tried to get a ransom from her. But in most cases, in some cases, the Irish looked upon this as a very romantic. And in some cases, they were married, you see. Henry got his idea from them. It's that when his sister decided that we would adopt Mary. And he attended his doctor. Nothing wrong with him, but what he wanted was to get a doctor's signature or some prescription or other. And he got the signature and forged a letter signed by the doctor and forged the signature. Mary's mother was living in the Maldig at the time and she, the letter came to Mary, to, uh, Mary Pike, staying with Cooper Penrose, that her mother was seriously ill and to come immediately to the hospital. So she got in the courtroom of dry doors, court was got ready and sat from the sister and when the Cooper Penrose family went with her. And anyway, Henry was waylaying for him with another coach, somewhere around St. Patrick's Church. It was a wet stormy night with a hole in gales. Now you can imagine that. By the church they were stopped. Henry had his face masked in two pistols. And uh, his sister was with him. And all the Mary, it's the court, and she was in the other courts, and it's just a camel down. There was Henry Lodging and all this sort of rubbish. So, on that wet holding night, they arrived at Vernon Mount. Henry lifted Mary over the coach, and he had some individual, so he dressed as a cleric and tried to force a marriage on her, so she threw the ring at Henry. Henry locked her up in the room. Atwell was there. In the, in the breakfast room, he said, with one Guthrie candle and the fire in ashes. The next thing was, the young cried, oh yes, he sent a Lord Mary to write a letter, and she wrote to her guardian, who immediately called the, the police of the time, the constabulary, and of course, the local militia were calling. So the troop, anyway, galloped up to Vernon Mount, thunder and lightning in all directions. And Apple was inside, looking dejected by the fire, always left of it. No sign of Henry. And Mary was there, and Mary went home with him. Reported immediately to Lord Lieutenant, who, of course, in his wisdom, put 500 pounds on his head with the public notice. And also the Pike family put 500 pounds, that's another, that's a thousand quite a considerable sum of money. And uh, the law was rather funny in those days. On Sunday, you could walk the street free. Nobody could touch. That was the law. For the rest of the week, you went into hiding. Well, Henry had plenty of places to hide with all his friends. Anyway, he was getting tired of this. And he decided he'd run for the corporation again. And he had a friend by the name of Colin, who was a, had a, an apothecary and a perfumer. His premises stood, I think, next to the Queen's Old Castle. That was his premises. And so the side is between him that he surrendered to him. He arrived apparently in a cart of cabbages, and Henry was in the centre. And he hopped over to that and surrendered to him, immediately arrested. John Philpott Cotton was for the Crown, and John Philpott Cotton knew if Henry was tried in court, how would happen? Get away with it, all the pallet on the jury, transfer to the doctor. Now, Henry, the sentence was, uh, Henry was sentenced to death, which was the law of the time for the abduction of young ladies. And the fa interesting factor is 12 judges sat in judgment on this. See, that uh, she was alive, and apparently he didn't rape her. It was commuted to life in prison in His Majesty's possessions overseas, commonly known as Botany Bay. Next thing was, Henry arrived in Cove, 
with his luggage and was transferred to a prison hulk. In those days, they were in the most of the Thames and all seaport were these prison hulks where you were kept there until the ship arrived to take you to your destination. The next thing was, Henry was put on board the Atlas, that was the ship that was to take him to New South Wales. And then the next thing was, Henry, I think, for some consideration, gave the captain, who was the name of Brooks, a token. And a sergeant that was on his way to New South Wales was shifted out of his cabin. Now Henry was placed in. And apparently in another storeroom nearby, Henry's luggage was put in. He dined at the captain's table, a convict. I'd say the captain got a good consideration for that. Now the route to New South Wales that time was to Bonas House and they go across to Australia in the latitude of the Roaring Forties. Strong winds behind them and it was very rough passage. When they arrived there, the sergeant decided he wasn't going to stand any more of us. They transferred to another ship that was sailed, sailed before the Atlas, arrived in Australia before Henry. Next in March, when Henry arrived, he was charged. He, oh yes, the uh, sergeant was then appointed magistrate and he accused Henry of this and that and the other, and Henry got a month or something in the mines. He didn't remain there long and he was loosed again. Now, it must be borne in mind that rank always brings privilege, and privilege brings this and privilege, and with money, you can do anything. Obviously, Henry had money. The money, of course, he came from this place. Probably he got five hundred, Colin got five hundred, and Colin built the house at the corner of the Grand Prix. In those days, Henry and his rank and families of gentlemen who had money were now subjected to hard labour, like breaking stones for roads and walking in quarries and all the rest of it. And convict labour built most of the prisons and some of the buildings that you see in Sydney. No. They were confined actually to a certain set of rules, but they were free men, just walk around and keep within those rules. So the story goes about Henry, that the area he was in was as effective with wildlife, snakes especially, and other forms of venom that we could get rid of. And of course snakes there at that time, there was a very dangerous snake there, I can't think of the name was, but uh, he'll go for you. So Henry, on a Patrick's day, according to the story, built, had the trench dug around the house, filled with turf, which he brought from Ireland, 500 bonds of us. The interesting factor is, it was laid by convicts. And Henry had three bottles of rum to celebrate Patrick's day and to keep the snakes out. Now, true or false, the story is, it can't be verified 100%, but, it's, but uh, my belief always is wherever there's a story, there's some, uh, there's some truth in it. They don't spring up by themselves. Henry then was, his friend was General Holt. General Holt was a Protestant tenant in Wicklow. And obviously his, grand, his landlord didn't like him for some weird and wrong reason. And he accused him of being United Irishman. So they raided his house and Holt decided to become one. And very successful when he came. He was transported into New South Wales and he was a friend of Henry Hayes. Now the governor was suspicious. But Holt was highly educated, Henry was highly educated, because most of the convicts that were all were completely uneducated. Then there was the rebellion with the Irish convicts about it, trans, that were transferred from the insurrection in Ireland in 1798. They were revolters. And the courts was put down with the usual shootings and hangings and the rest. The governor was very suspicious of Henry and all this, and so he was watched. In the meantime, a new governor was appointed, Captain Bly. 
famous Captain Bly of the HMS Bounty was appointed as governor of New South Wales. Now, a military man in charge, a naval man in charge of a military establishment is not going to work. There was there the New South Wales Yeomanry, and these gentlemen decided to go into business. Quite a number of the settlers that came there were dissatisfied, and quite a number left and went back home again. And if you would have had a bit of property for sale, they'd offer you three bottles of all, small little bottles, and you agreed. Now, suppose at that time it was rather expensive. So you got your rum and you made a few bobs and that. Blythe Sean Dove's book, they mutinied. And the next thing was, they arrested Fly and put him into the local prison. Henry was fast off the mark. He sided with Fly and he was thrown into prison, knowing, of course, eventually he'd get his pardon for the part he played. The colonel in charge of the militia, the Rose of Wales Yeomanry, was sent to London for trial. He was such an elegant speaker. The charges were dropped against him, and they said he had the audacity to ask His Majesty George III for some of his famous flock of sheep. And they said His Majesty graciously granted him the herd of Marina sheep, and from that herd of sheep came the great herds of Australia today. In the meantime, uh, all the beauty was quelled. Um, the regiment, the 73rd Regiment, was sent out under the command of Captain Sir Morris O'Connor, one of O'Donnell's, then O'Connor's family. They quelled us. And Henry then was waiting to know what was going to happen to him. But I promised him that he'd uh, receive the pardon. But he did, but the mutineers had taken the great seal and would not be legal. He was transferred back to the UK. He kept his promise. He wrote the pardon for Henry Hayes. But dear Henry, his troubles were no obvious. On his way home, I think the name of the ship was the Endeavour, she was wrecked on the Falkland Islands. What happened was, the captain apparently had on, on board, so we say, three or four ladies whom he took a liking to. And in those days, the captain set the courses and everything. First mate knew a little about the good season orders, the captain set the course. And apparently, the captain was entertaining some of the ladies on board. And the mate went up to him and knocked at the door and said, Sorry, so we were there to coast and all the rest of it, and I'm not sure of our position. So the captain told me, You know enough about navigation, go away, I'm entertaining ladies here, and do not disturb me. The ship ran aground. No one was in danger because he ran right up. Somebody accused Henry of running away and leaving everybody behind him, but where the ship was placed, there was nobody drowned. But the fascinating thing was the come years. This was 1812. What happened was there was an American ship nearby and they claimed salvage, not the vessel. And, well, the sea law, this is the sea law, and land law is the land law. However, the British warship suddenly appeared and arrested and took them prisoners of war the crew of the American vessel. England and America were at war in 1812. They didn't know it down in that part of the world. What happened there was, the American Navy, the sea, was only starting. And of course, the British Navy and British merchantmen were experts, being a small nation at sea. So they were offering very huge wages to seamen who desert and joined the American Navy, which they did. So to stop us in the Britain declared war on America, well, they settled the problem afterwards. Henry eventually got home. 
the news of the royalty, the royalty was shunned by polite society, especially the ladies. He resided for a while in a, in a house near the Mercy Hospital and eventually moved up to Grattan Hill. And there Henry died, 1830, and was buried in the vault of Christchurch. Now, about eight or nine years ago, a friend of mine in the library, Mary O'Leary, she, what they call her, was contacted by a gentleman from New so from Sydney by the name of Ralph Grunstedt. He was a lecturer in the, in the school or university in the higher mathematics. And he was putting something together with Henry Hayes. And Mary told him that I knew something about it, so that's, that's the connection between the two of us. I did research to Henry Hayes and I had two box files full of that on him. And he had that uh, that I never saw and I had that he never saw, so we came together and we were exchanging data for years and he was putting a book together. Early this year, he presented the, his book to the Lord Mayor in the City Library, a company of the Liberian and the staff. The book is in the city library, not in the lending department, I think it's up in the reference department of the local history department. And that in this the saga of Henry Hayes. Henry said in modern times is still remembered in New South Wales, very much so in New South Wales. There was actually a museum open to his memory at Barcoo's house. But I think that has disappeared for some weird and unknown reason. And in modern times, Henry rests peacefully in the walls of Christchurch, I believe you and me, after a turbulent life. And that ends the saga of Henry Hayes.